Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Booker and Beyond, Analyzing Sentencing Reform and Exploring New Research Directions, hosted by the National Institute of Justice. For notification about today's webinar, the opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed here are those of the presenters themselves and do not necessarily reflect the positions or policies of the National Institute of Justice of the U.S. Department of Justice. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nancy Merritt, Senior Policy Advisor within the National Institute of Justice, for some welcome remarks and introductions of today's speakers. Thank you, Daryl, and thank you all for joining us for the webinar. I'll be moderating the discussion today along with Raven Lewis, a PhD candidate at Rutgers, who we're happy to have working with us at NIJ as a research assistant. Today's webinar is entitled Booker and Beyond, Analyzing Sentencing Reform and Exploring New Research Directions. The U.S. Supreme Court's 2005 Booker decision provides the starting point for today's conversation, but the discussion will address criminal justice sentencing reform research in general. The webinar presentation will address selected research findings from the last 15 years, with particular attention paid to the analytic methods used. We'll then discuss the strengths and weaknesses of these methods and implications for future research. Importantly, the webinar and follow-up discussion will not be limited to book or research. One of the primary goals of the webinar is to encourage audience members to think about new ways of approaching reform research and how future research efforts could be improved through the use of new analytic tools and methodologies, improved training, and enhanced access to data. We're very fortunate to be he hearing from three experts today, all of whom have extensive experience studying and reporting on sentencing reform. We will begin with a presentation by Dr. Jeffrey Ulmer, Professor of Sociology and Criminology at the Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Ulmer received his PhD in sociology from Penn State and conducts research in areas including courts and sentencing, criminological theory and symbolic interactionism, religion and crime, and race, disadvantage, and violence rates. He's received funding for his research from the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Justice, and other organizations in addition to numerous awards for his research and publications. Dr. Ulmer will be followed by Dr. Mona Lynch with the School of Social Ecology at UC Irvine, where she serves as Interim Dean and Chancellor's Professor of Criminology, Law, and Society, with an appointment in the School of Law. Dr. Lynch is a social psychologist by training. Her current research addresses plea bargaining, criminal sentencing, and punishment processes, with a focus on institutionalized forms of bias within the criminal legal system. As an NIJ W.E.B. Du Bois scholar in race and crime, she's currently studying the effects of implicit bias instructions on jury decision making. She's published widely and is the recipient of numerous research grants and publication awards. Finally, we'll, we'll hear from Dr. Paul Hofer. Dr. Hofer has a PhD in research psychology from Johns Hopkins University and a JD from the University of Maryland School of Law. Dr. Hofer worked at the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, D.C. for a decade before moving to the U.S. Sentencing Commission as Special Projects Director in 1995. After working as a Soros Justice Fellow, he returned to federal service in 2009 with the Federal Public Defender Sentencing Resource Council. He retired from the federal courts in March, but has continued his 35 years as adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Johns Hopkins. I'll ask the presenters some brief follow-up questions after the presentations, then open up the floor to the audience for additional questions. Please forward your questions as instructed at the beginning of the webinar, and Raven will pass them on for discussion. We will address as many of the questions as possible during the webinar. Thank you again for your participation, and now I'll turn it over to Dr. Ulmer. Dr. Ulmer? Thank you. So as, um, as Nancy said, I'm a professor of sociology and criminology here at Penn State University, where um, we have a long tradition of studying courts and sentencing, and where 
also the Pennsylvania Commission on Sentencing is based. Um, so, so we have here at the university, the Sentencing Commission of the of the state of Pennsylvania. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about four studies of federal sentencing primarily um, that start with the the issues raised by the Booker decision and claims about disparity um, increasing after the Booker decision, but then moves on to um, other more recent research that looks at other ways that the guidelines work and don't work and other um, mechanisms of disparity, other other locations of despair of racial and ethnic disparity primarily um, that um, are much more based in the social context of district courts. <clears throat> to start with with the with the issues raised by Booker and in a pair of articles by myself and Michael Light and John Kramer, um, John Kramer being the, um, he was once the executive director of the U.S. Sentencing Commission in the late 90s, um, but he's also long been a, a professor, now professor emeritus of sociology and criminology here at Penn State. But um, following the Booker Fan Fan decision and the Gall decision and others, um, this expanded judicial dis sentencing discretion relative to the period right before the um, Booker decision, and also um, the period of the 90s and early 2000s. Many feared that this increase in, in judicial discretion would cause an increase in disparity. Um, and the 2010-2011 U.S. Sentencing Commission reports found that racial disparity in sentence lengths did indeed increase post-Booker and post-Gall. Um, especially post Gaul, um, 2007. Um, we, my colleagues and I, provided an alternative analysis to the U.S. Sentencing Report, which um, pursued some different kind of methodologies, some different uh, statistical assumptions, and and we found some different. We we also went somewhat beyond the the. Uh, the U.S. Sentencing Commission report in the in the two studies, really, in 2011, and we found that you know we, we widened the comparison per time periods to not just the 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 uh, the period of time that the U.S. Sentencing Commission report compared to, which was the the period of time from 2003 to 2005 um, under the um, more restrictive guidelines regime under the Protect Act and the Feeney Amendment, um, which it's not completely important what those are, but they made the they res the restricted judicial discretion even more so than it had been before. The guidelines were, if you want to think about it this way, more mandatory than ever before during that period. And then com their report compared the post Booker and post Gall period with the pre with the, this 2003 to 2005 period. We went all the way back to pre-2003 and even into the 90s. Um, and we found that levels of disparity while present, racial, ethnic, and gender disparity, while present was generally comparable to the pre-2003 levels um, when the guidelines were in fact still mandatory um, and not just advisory. Um, it was just different from the the uh, um, the 2003 to 2005 period when the guidelines were really restrictive, and we found that African male American males odds of imprisonment increased significantly post Gaul, but sentence lengths did not. Um, and we found that immigration cases accounted for a significant portion of the sentence length disparity affecting black males. Um, and then questioning the, you know, the focus on, on just judicial discretion, we found that, um, government sponsored departures below guidelines, that is, um, guidelines, departures below guidelines that were endorsed by the, uh, 
the U.S. attorney's offices, um, the federal prosecutors, were a greater source of racial disparities than judge-initiated deviations from the sentencing guidelines. So the upshot is we argued that these findings raised questions about whether the decisions, Rita or Gall, Booker, Rita, caused increased disparity. Um, and ultimately raising questions whether the guidelines must be mandatory and able to limit racial, ethnic, and gender disparities. And this gets at the second study. Um, this was a study done by myself and, and Brian Johnson at the University of Maryland um, based on a survey of federal judges we did in from 2005 to 2007. And when we fielded the survey, unbeknownst to us, we captured the period of time right after Booker. Um, we, we, we captured the, the immediate aftermath of Booker in our survey, 2005 survey. And then we looked at 2005 to 07 sentencing data, and we had qualitative interviews as well um, with U.S. attorneys, judges, and defense attorneys. Um, it captured this period of uncertainty after Booker, um, but before later decisions clarified what the ad advisory guidelines really meant. Um, and it was a time of great variation among judges in the perceived constraint and normative authority of the guidelines. And that's what exactly what our survey captured. We found that during this period, at least, guideline conformity in other words, judges following the guidelines versus departing, deviating from the guidelines, were strongly influenced by judges' perceptions of the guidelines as normatively legitimate. In other words, their, their perception of the guidelines as the right, normatively right sentencing standards um, versus inappro being inappropriate sentencing standards, uh, being too, too severe, too too harsh, um, not legitimate. And they also depended on the perceptions of the constraint from their circuit courts in terms of appeals of guidelines issues and their perceptions of their local U.S. attorney's offices um, and their actions and their likelihood of appealing or their, their uh, you know, their, their pursuit of government sponsored departures or or their plea agreement practices. So these three kind of informal factors strongly influenced judges' percept judges' conformity to the guidelines. And in fact, um, influenced their conformity to the guidelines more than anything else, um, more than any other attitudes of the judges or characteristics of the judges. And so a key theme of this was that guideline, maybe guidelines do not primarily exert influence through constraint, through, through, um, through force, but rather through normative influence, through being seen as appropriate benchmarks, um, best practices, and by making sentencing easier and reducing uncertainty. Thus, perhaps guidelines um, the perceived legitimacy and appropriateness of the guidelines is very important to judges following the guidelines in an area of advisory guidelines, which, by the way, other sentencing guideline systems, such as Pennsylvania, have always been what uh, advisory in the way that the federal courts the guidelines are advisory. Here's a study by myself and Noah Painter Davis and Lee Tinnick in 2016. Um, this study looked at federal court data and Pennsylvania state court data, Pennsylvania being the guideline state. And we wanted to see how much uh, of disparity, racial and ethnic disparity, came from factors that are determined before sentencing. So, so we, we looked at when you introduce, when you look at just the raw differences in um, Black, Hispanic, or Latino men um, versus white men and the sentences they get. Um, and then you start controlling for or holding constant the, the different things that under guidelines affect um, 
sentencing and um, and mandatory minimums. Um, and then you, how much of the disparity, the, the differences between these groups is due to these things that are decided before um, sentencing begins. Um, and we talked about a distinction from uh, Bush, Sean Bushway and Brian Forrest of type A discretion, which is the discretion exercised by local judges and courts, and B, type B discretion. Um, the discretion that's of policymakers that's built into sentencing guidelines and other sentencing policies. Um, we found that most of the disproportionality, most of the racial and ethnic differences, um, especially in the federal, we were able to um, explain most of the disparity in the federal data with things that happen before sentencing begins. The guideline factors, mandatory minimums, case processing factors like how you how one was convicted, whether by trial or by guilty plea, and extra legal, other extra legal factors, um, importantly, such as citizenship um, and education. It, by the way, in the Pennsylvania analysis, um, we could not mediate, um, we could not explain uh, as much of the variation, the black, white different, and Hispanic differences in um, state court data with things that happened prior to sentencing, um, thus indicating that there was still some some um, disparity or uh, or unexplained differences um, at the sentencing stage. Two, the two la last studies I'll talk about are the the theme is that disparity, racial, ethnic, and other forms of disparity is complicated and it's bound up in the social context of local courts. Um, something of, the, of a theme of mine throughout my career. Um, a pay, a, uh, an article by myself and Mindy Bradley, um, we looked at the sentencing of Native American defendants um, and the complexities of, of uh, tribal and federal justice and the of federal jurisdiction over native over crime and Native American lands. Um, the upshot was the tight and the, you know the article goes into a great deal of detail about the the nuances and complexities of this of this tribal federal justice relationship and this organizational coupling between tribal justice and federal justice through different federal funding mechanisms. Um, like the 2010 Tribal Law and, Law and Order Act, um, the Major Crimes Act, federal ju jurisdiction, and so forth. We found that the more tightly bound, the more tight the relationships between tribal, tribal courts um, and federal justice, um, federal law enforcement, federal, um, the federal U.S. attorney's offices, the tighter those participation in these programs, the more sentencing severity increased for Native Americans. Um, so Native American defendants got harsher sentences the more tribes cooperated with federal justice. Um, maybe that was intended, maybe that was not, but that was the effect. Um, also, interestingly, because of this tribal federal length, link um, we've the tighter the linkage between federal law enforcement u.s attorney's offices and tribes um, we saw greater substantial assistance and government sponsored departures below the guidelines for native americans um, the these are sentencing guidelines departures that um, are for that are controlled by or initiated by the prosecutors um, to foster substantial assistance to law enforcement or reward other behavior, the government sponsored departures that the prosecutors would like to um, move for a more lenient sentence. So this this makes sense that the the U.S. attorney's offices may have been using 
these mechanisms to get more cooperation, some more assistance, more assistance from Native American defendants um, in the prosecution of other Native American defendants. Finally, um, this is a very recent study. Um, myself and Brandy Parker, we looked at um, Hispanic defendants sentencing disadvantage in in different types of immigration destinations. Um, in sociology, uh, sociologists have studied um, you know, the differences in the in the types of immigration destinations and the reception that Hispanic immigrants receive there. Um, we thought that perhaps um, Hispanic citizens and non-citizens would receive harsher sentences in some immigrant destinations than others. We found that there was no disparity in, no Hispanic white disparity in traditional immigrant destinations um, in either time period, 2000, early 2000s or 2010 to 12. Um, traditional de destinations being New Mexico, Southern California, South Texas, um, South Florida, places like that. Um, there was greater in, in the 2000, in the, around the 2000 census, around the turn of the, the 21st century, Hispanic citizens and non-citizens received longer sentences in places that were new destinations, places where there was a new wave of Hispanic immigration. Think places like districts in North Carolina, Indiana, Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, um, and so forth. Places that saw new immigration, Hispanic immigration in the 1990s. And also in non-destinations, places where there was little Hispanic immigration, but Hispanic defendants were harshly treated there. By the early 2000s, um, there was no disparity in the traditional destinations and in what you might think of as new, new destinations, emerging destinations, places that had seen a lot of immigration, Hispanic, Hispanic immigration from 2000 to 2010. But again, um, especially for Hispanic non-citizens, um, in the new destinations around the 21st century, and especially in the non-immigrant destinations, the places where there was little immigration, Hispanic non-citizens were sentenced much more harshly. Um, and this was especially true of undocumented non-citizens. So Hispanic white sentencing disparity and for Hispanic citizens and non-citizens varies greatly um, by, is affected, correlated strongly with levels of local immigration in a district. So the upshot of these four studies I've explained to you and I can expand later, but federal sentencing disparity existed before Booker, it exists after, um, and it's tightly bound to social contexts, thus defying simplistic ep explanations of disparity that rely on guideline changes that affect judicial discretion. Um, you know, if we restrict judicial discretion, we will get less disparity. This research really problematizes that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. That was a great presentation. It really um, shows us the importance of looking at court and community um, context in studying this decision-making process. Um, I'm gonna save my questions for you until uh, we get to the end of all the presentations and um, turn it over now to Dr. Lynch. Well, thank you. First, let me just thank you for having me and um, for being part of this and to the attendees for, for coming. This is a long time coming. We've been trying to organize this for a while and really happy to see it come through and really pleased to be with two people whose work I've admired for a very long time and who I've learned from um, over the years as I've kind of dabbled into the federal sentencing world. Um, so let me just begin by saying my, my approach to um, the way I came to Booker was really through uh, 
uh, my interest in law and society scholarship and thinking about how um, policy gets kind of put into action on the ground and what are the ways that uh, institutional actors respond, resist, kind of, uh, you know, reinterpret what the policy is supposed to do. And I've done this kind of work in a number of different kinds of settings um, and came to the federal court sort of late in my um, career in, of doing this. Um, so the so when I approached the first project in on the Booker case, um, I was thinking about a couple of things. One was how are policy changes responded to and resisted in varied and creative ways by legal actors? Um, and how do those variations manifest as local norms and practices that transcend the policy change? So a kind of a tension point that I thought about is how, what, in what ways do um, local actors and their local context try to maintain some stability in the face of um, policy change? And Booker's a really nice example um, or a nice case to study because it was really imposed upon these disparate district courts. There's um, there's 90, 92 districts, 94 districts. I, can never remember. I can't, I, I think 92 or 94 districts. There's divisions within districts that have their own local norms and so on. Um, and this came from the Supreme Court to sort of say, okay, now a lot of discretion is going from prosecutors to judges in, um, federal sentencing. Um, so Jeff talked a little bit about these issues around kind of local norms and local contents and, and local culture. Um, those are things that also really resonated with me in this approach. Um, so the first study that I did was, uh, um, let me see, where am I? I have to go down. Um, it was a quantitative study of the federal sentencing uh, data. And what I was looking at was just drug cases. And I was interested in drug cases, particularly because they're really sort of subject to two sets of um, sentencing logics. Um, one is the sen sentencing guidelines that was at the t prior to Booker. Um, basically, mandatory judges were stuck with the sentencing guidelines, except under very limited conditions. Um, and then the mandatory uh, minimum statutes, which set a baseline for some sentences. And the mandatory statutes, or what we call mandatory minimums, are uh, most prevalent in drug cases. The mandatory minimums were not affected by Booker, so those bottoms still sat there. And as certainly as Jeff's work has shown and others has shown, um, that really mattered in terms of what happened after Booker. So I was interested in how these two kinds of um, sentencing logics were working after Booker. And I asked a series of questions um, about uh, how drug cases sort of were adjudicated and outcomes um, pre and post Booker. So the first question I asked was, do within dr district drug case sentencing patterns demonstrate stability across different policy periods, indicating the influence of um, local norms? So the question there is, if you look at a given district, is it sort of behaving like itself over time versus being impacted really strongly by these outside um, policy changes and then kind of flipping its behave behavior? Um, the second question is, are the mechanisms for getting to sentence outcomes changing in response to policy reforms? And I suspected that, yes, there would be this sort of um, motivation or sort of um, push towards stability that would mean that that legal actors would have to figure out how to get to where they wanted to get, but they'd have to work within these new rules. Um, and there's certainly a lot of research across a number of different institutions that would suggest that that's the case. Um, and then third are cases that are not subject to, to mandatory minimums. So the ones that are simply sort of being freed from prosecutorial control in terms of charging and allowing judges to have a lot more discretion in terms of sentencing, are those more likely to vary um, from the guidelines compared to those um, that are subject to ma mandatory minimums? Um, so I published that work with, um, at that point, my graduate student, Marissa Omori, who she's now an assistant professor at University of Missouri at St. Louis, um, back in 2014. Um, what we found is that, yes, in fact, there is a, a 
fair amount of stability across the different policy periods within uh, districts indicating that um, local norms did matter and that there was this sort of pressure to sort of maintain um, outcomes in drug cases, even with uh, Booker. And we looked at several different policy um, periods as Jeff just described, um, the, the, there were um, a number of periods in terms of how restrictive the guidelines were um, that we looked at. And basically what we found is that there is a sort of pressure to maintain stability. Um, and we did find some evidence, as did others, that the mechanisms for getting to those sentences, sentencing outcomes did change in response to policy reform and found a real effect of sort of using mandatory minimums as a way to get to those outcomes. So prosecutors charged more mandatory minimums and um, to, to control the judicial discretion. And finally, the, on the question of our um, cases that are not subject to mandatory minimums more likely to vary from the guidelines compared to um, those that were subject to them. We found no, actually no evidence of that um, because there was this sort of um, overarching pressure to maintain the norms. So here's a, just a really simple graph that shows um, the percentage of the guideline minimum sentence um, that's imposed nationally um, beginning back in the early guidelines um, period 92, all the way through 2012, the end of the period for which that study was done. And you can see there's really not that much change that the, if the guideline minimum is 100%, drug cases are pretty much being sentenced to about 85% um, of the guideline minimum across all periods. The one kind of uptick is that PROTECT Act period that Jeff just mentioned. Um, so so again a lot of stability and within that if you just break it out even regionally you'll see that the south has the highest are the closest to the guideline minimums across all periods the um, midwest is second in terms of that the um, west is third and then the northeast is really the most um, generous in terms of giving low sentences or, or breaks on the guideline minimum so you see the most change um, in are, are the most reduction from the guideline minimum in the um, Northeast. So you can, so there's a sense of both regional norms as well as district level norms. So I followed that study. I was, I was, you know, sort of my appetite was whetted by doing that work. And so I followed by doing a qualitative study in four dis districts that I selected for their kind of distinct features and I did um, observations of how drug cases were adjudicated and I did interviews with legal actors and part of that and this was you know this is really pretty retrospective at this point it was in 2013 that I did the study so Booker had come into um, really had started to um, take effect and shape things by 2005 but there were a number of actors who still who were there during that period who I was able to talk to about how it changed um, how the Booker case changed local practices. Um, I asked a series of questions to those actors who had been in the system at that time about um, specific legal strategies that had changed at three different stages of the criminal process, how charging changed, how plea negotiation changed, changed and how sentencing um, had changed. Um, so while uh, Professor Ulmer's study it done in 2005 captured that sort of like what is going to happen and there's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty about how um, Booker is going to shake out. By this point when I was interviewing people, people were very clear about sort of that trajectory, what had happened and how it had changed um, norms and culture. Um, and in fact, they did mention that there was a lot of uncertainty at first and there was a fair amount of um, kind of um, fidelity to the guidelines in the early um, in the early period right after Booker in all in all four districts. So what I found was that um, there are multiple effects of Booker um, and there was a fair amount of local variation in that it, within that. So across all four districts, there was an increased charging of mandatory minimum um, uh, charges and mandatory minimum enhancements, which is an, another way of getting at these sort of mandatory bottoms um, that prosecutors have, especially in drug cases and in child porn cases. 
Um, so that was really prosecutors' um, effort to create a bottom and, and sort of stop that discretion from going lower than what they hoped it would be. Um, but even more important in terms of doing qualitative work was that the threats to use mandatory minimums and mandatory enhancements were um, used quite frequently in plea bargaining, particularly in drug cases, um, child pornography cases, um, which have a set of laws that allow for um, those threats for very similar kinds of conduct. Um, so the so those threats don't show up in those outcome data that we use to look quantitatively at what's going on in the federal system. But it became very clear that this is a common practice in um, in plea bargaining, which is to use the threat of mandatory minimums or enhancements to for prosecutors to get where they want to go. Um, and within that, there was quite a bit of bargaining in the shadow of the assigned judge. So judges became much more important since they were less constrained. Um, and so um, defense attorneys would have the kind of upper hand in certain kinds of cases where they knew that the judge was sympathetic and would be um, likely to sentence below the guidelines. Um, prosecutors held the upper hand in cases where the um, the judges were more, say, guideline centric, um, but generally there was also a move towards a bit more use of what are called binding pleas to tie the judge's hands if the plea is accepted. So the judge wouldn't have to accept the binding plea, but um, if the if the prosecutor, um, I mean, if the judge was willing to accept the plea, um, he or she would be limited in terms of the sentence that could be imposed by the um, by that plea bargain that's made. And then finally, a really interesting finding, and this was only in my Northeastern district, so I did kind of a regional um, uh, variation. Um, there was a real move to forego plea agreements at all. So the prosecutor sort of got knocked out of the process and with the right judge, uh, a, a defense attorney would just take the case, you know, plea straight up, take the case to the judge, put on a very robust sentencing hearing and um, see what the judge did on that. And by the time I was doing my field work, this was relatively common. This had become a new cultural norm where that hadn't existed at all prior to um, Booker. And again, these are the kinds of things that would be harder to detect in the quantitative data, but are really important for understanding how um, adaptation happens and how um, policy lives on the ground, shall we say. Um, so the so the last study I want to talk about is one that doesn't have anything to do with Booker, um, but it was really motivated by the same kinds of questions. And um, it's to ask the question is, what about internal policy changes? So again, the Booker case is sort of an exogenous um, policy change enforced upon these uh, uh, district actors who may or may not agree with it and may or may not sort of chafe it at being told what um, told about these new rules. Um, but the it, Department of Justice also has its own internal policies that change uh, often sometimes dramatically with changing administrations. And we had a perfect um, kind of example of this in 2017 um, under then Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who basically undid a number of um, internal policy reforms that Holder had instituted under Obama. Um, and the most significant one, at least for drug cases, was that um, Holder created a policy that um, that prevented, that asked U.S. attorneys not to charge mandatory minimums in cases that met certain kinds of guidelines for being, quote unquote, low level um, drug cases. And that policy um, was instituted in 2013 and Sessions came in and rescinded that also increase, you know, encourage prosecutors to use all to use all mandatory minimums. They were told to always use mandatory minimums, to use mandatory enhancements in plea bargaining and so on. So this is a real change from the kind of move that the Obama administration was trying to um, do to lessen the number of people in federal prison for um, for drugs, um, and to um, and so what happened after Sessions did that? Well, the dr use of drug mandatory minimum shot up. In my last slide, we'll show a picture of this. 
um, the likelihood of prison increase for drug cases, um, drug sentence lengths increased, um, and the effects, and this is the most interesting thing I think we found, was the effects were significantly driven by the appointment of a Trump-appointed U.S. attorney in a district, um, so that person could kind of impose a new policy in the local office. Um, and what this told us is that it really takes that sort of translation of the policy to the office and that sort of um, uh, convergence around the ideals of the policy um, to really make a, a policy sort of be wholeheartedly taken up and um, and um, and put into place. Now, there's a lot of variations based on other factors or regional variations or variations around kind of population issues and so on. But this was a very interesting finding for us um, and sort of an important one to sort of raise the question about, you know, who, what do kind of mid-level actors, um, what role do they play in terms of policy implementation? So I'll just end with a slide here of our findings. So this is the proportion of drug cases sentenced um, to bi binding mandatory minimums. And you can see prior to the first, there was an early holder memo that basically gave more local control to um, prosecutors and rescinded some of the prior Bush um, policies around drug cases. Um, there's a drop in the mandatory minimums that really becomes dramatic after the Holder 2013 memo. And then this very quick um, uh, shooting up of the use of mandatory minimums to actually exceed where they were just a tiny bit um, under the Bush era. Um, so with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lynch. Um, that uh, I really like the last slide. It really shows the importance of looking not only at changes in the law, but changes in the policy, and then looking at changes over time. Because as there's, as you point out, the adaptation that's allowed given different cir certain circumstances can really change the way um, the change in the law is played out. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to turn now to Dr. Hofer who is going to uh, give our last presentation, which will be followed by um, some questions and answers. Uh, Dr. Hofer. Well, thanks, Nancy and NIJ for organizing the webinar and greetings to our online participants and Jeff and Mona, whose work I've followed for many years. As Nancy mentioned in her intro, I've been analyzing sentence reform for my entire career because I happened to begin at the Federal Judicial Center in 1986, right as the commission and the guidelines were coming online. And since then, moving to the commission and to the public defenders, I've been analyzing the system from several different uh, angles. Uh, my remarks today are going to, are, are elaborated. Let's see, there we go. In uh, a chapter in the 2019 volume of uh, Crime and Justice series by edited by Michael Tonry and, and a number of other papers, one in criminology and public policy, Booker as a natural experiment, and a number of articles in the Federal Sentencing Report where I review different reports by the commission. Uh, my main conclusion from analyzing sentencing reform is from all these different angles is that it's never really been tried in the federal system. The original conception of the SRA was as a good government progressive uh, reform. It set up an independent expert agency to develop policy based on research. But right away, even in the original act itself, congressional micromanagement began to creep in. And it's continued throughout the guidelines uh, era. I mean, especially in drug cases and sex offenses against children economic crimes, immigration offenses, and of course, most notably, uh, the Sentence and Reform Act was betrayed before the guidelines even took effect in 1986 with passage of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act that created these mandatory minimums for drug offenders based on the quantity of a mixture or substance containing a detect detectable amount of it, various drugs. This stopped the research-driven process of drug development in its tracks. Those policies were incorporated into uh, the guidelines and in some ways made worse. 
And this was the single greatest contributor to the tripling of the federal prison population and the growing gap between sentences imposed on black and white defendants that opened up right after supposedly sentence of reform uh, took effect. Most defendants today are not sentenced under guidance that were developed by the commission in what uh, the Supreme Court case of Kimbrough called the exercise of its characteristic institutional role. In other words, as an independent expert uh, agency. When Booker came along, it kindled the hope that um, increased judicial discretion might revive some aspects of the original vision of reform. One hope was that it would allow more departures based on offender characteristics that the commission had deemed not ordinarily relevant uh, to the sentencing decision. And indeed, judge-sponsored below-range sentences did increase by nearly 10%, as shown here on this chart, at the time of the Booker decision, the vertical blue line. They continued a gradual increase until 2015, and then have largely uh, leveled off. This was a general loosening of restrictions on the kinds of departures that judges were doing or wanting to do uh, before Booker. Departures based on the defendant's family circumstances or age or physical or emotional conditions. For many of us, the biggest hope created by Booker was that judges might initiate a new kind of review of the guidelines, looking not just for unusual factors in the case or about the uh, defendant, but reviewing the pedigree and the research support for the various guidelines, the most important of which were not based on a research, and that research has not really validated as being fair uh, and effective. The idea was that judges could re reject unsound guidelines, even in, in routine cases. We did see some of this review of the child porn guidelines for some types of drugs, such as uh, crack and ecstasy, although it's notable that in the entire period, even when the commission was saying the 100 to 1 ratio between powder and crack cocaine was unfair, and the Department of Justice was not defending it, there wasn't a single circuit court that found that the quantity ratio was unreasonable. It only got changed later uh, when the commission and eventually Congress in 2010 uh, lowered uh, or raised rather the quantity threshold for crack to make the ratio um, 18 to 1 instead of 100 to 1. The third big hope was created by Booker was that the commission and Congress might be driven to amend the guidelines that were not developed and validated with research. I think Booker did help empower uh, the revision of that crack guideline, but it largely stopped there. I can't say that judicial revolt against unfair guidelines has led to additional amendments after that one. So the optimism fostered by Booker has been largely extinguished. Uh, the USSC itself uh, took some steps to reinforce the guidelines. They created this three-step process where you needed to calculate the guideline range and then consider the recommendations in the manual for possible departures and only then uh, get to a third stage where you might evaluate the guideline recommendation itself in light of the purposes of a sentencing. That kind of administrative-like review was discouraged by many appellate courts who argued that judges weren't in a position uh, like the commission to develop sentencing uh, policy, even though the commission often doesn't get final say on sentencing policy. And I have to say there was some apathy among district judges, many of whom have only known the guideline system, and um, just assume that there must be some foundation uh, for the guideline recommendations or some evidence that they are fair and effective. 
It's worth noting, I think, that in the last quarterly report from the commission, there's only 43% of defendants who are sentenced within the guideline range. The commission's kind of obscured this fact in recent years because now they report a new number of cases sentenced under the guidelines manual, which means they were within the range or it was a departure for a reason that's discussed in the manual. Um, but despite this increase in sentences below the range, it has not translated into any reduction in the portion of defendants going to prison. As we can see here, there's a long-term trend towards increasing imprisonment. And, and frankly, in 2005, the Booker decision didn't create a blip. Nor has it resulted in a marked reduction in average sentence lengths. This chart shows in blue mean sentence lengths from 2001 through 2017. In orange, it's the guideline minimum recommended by the guideline uh, manual. Even though there were additional sentences below the guideline range after Booker, which you'd think would reduce sentence lengths, those reductions were offset by increases in the sentences recommended by the guidelines. In drug cases and in white collar crime cases, the average sentences began to fall only years later, not due to Booker, but mostly due to reductions and revisions in the guidelines themselves. Notably, uh, two points off that the commission uh, applied to all drugs in the drug quantity table and the reduction of the threshold for, or the increase in the quantity threshold for crack cocaine. So in summary, the mandatory minimums and guidelines continue to dominate the trends of the types and lengths of sentences imposed. Sentences move in tandem with the guideline uh, minimums. Many have noted that this reflects the continuing gravitational pull of the guideline of recommendations. The SRA did not give control of sentencing policy to an independent expert agency, but it did create a centralized system of sentencing rules that Congress, and to some extent, the Commission has used to control um, largely control sentencing policy. Booker didn't reverse that central fact. This Booker is, this webinar is about Booker and beyond, and I've kind of entered the beyond phase of my career now. I'm also somewhat beyond hope that the guidelines can be salvaged. To do so, it would require repeal of the mandatory statutory minimums repeal of the scores of specific directives that Congress has given to the commission to increase sentences or set sentences at a certain level, and it would require a reinvigorated commission dedicated to evidence-based policymaking and comprehensive amendment of the most used guidelines. Now, some have suggested that even if the policymaking role of the commission has failed, its research mission remains viable. Certainly the commission collects and makes available a great deal of data. But the commission's failed in its research mission, in my opinion, and increasingly so in recent years. This means that outside researchers must rise to the challenge and do the critical evaluations of federal sentencing policy that the USSC has lately been avoiding. It's worth remembering what a strong research mandate the USSC gave the commission. It was charged with developing means of measuring the degree to which sentencing penal and correctional practices are effective in meeting the purposes of sentencing. In 2004, I authored the commission's 15-year review, and it was explicitly focused on evaluating the success of the sentencing reform and achieving the purposes of sentencing reform. The question of how well the guidelines 
actually reflected fair, proportionate, and effective sentencing was supposed to be the next phase of evaluation, but it's really never happened. If one reviews recent commission reports, you'll see that they largely decline to critically evaluate the guidelines or even the statutory minimum. The reports are full of charts and factoids, most of which are of unclear relevance to any policy decision and are often confusing or downright misleading. I don't have time here to detail all the problems, but somebody needs to do this. And I think the research community should rise to the occasion. For example, there was a report just this past March on armed career criminals. These are people convicted of a gun offense who, if they have two prior violent or drug offenses, receive some, a 15-year mandatory minimum and some of the longest sentences in the system. Three quarters of these defendants are African American. This was intended as an incapacitation measure. So its success should depend on how well it is actually targeting those dangerous Offenders, but this report reported that 59% of these defendants are rearrested after eight years. That's lower than the rearrest rate for a, a, a defendant that's just in category three out of six criminal history categories under the guidelines. In other words, it's not targeted anywhere near on the most dangerous or most high risk defendants, but there's not a critical word or recommendation in the report suggesting that this guideline is poorly targeted. We found a similar problem with a 2016 report on career offenders, although there, the commission did recommend some statutory change. It recommended that radically increased sentences under the career offender guideline shouldn't occur when the predicate offenses, the past offenses are only drug offenses. But it didn't make a strong case for it. It didn't lay out the strongest possible evidence. and nothing has happened. I could go on with more examples. The commission issued a fact sheet on a report the commission issued last year on the supposed deterrent effect of 10-year sentences. Uh, I direct you to find the fact sheet from the federal public defenders. The bottom line is that outside researchers need to do this critical evaluation that the USSC neglects. We need research focused on which defendants are at highest risk of future violence and which relatively low risk offenders are sentenced far too long. It'd be nice to have a crimes averted model that could measure the incapacitation effects of alternative policies. I started work on such a model when I was at the commission, but nothing's happened to it uh, subsequently. We need proportionality studies. Uh, what guidelines over punish relative to the seriousness uh, of the crime. We've talked a lot about the drug guidelines. And I got to tell you, this is a national embarrassment and disgrace. I have a paper at SSRN that demonstrates that the current quantity thresholds found in the guidelines and mandatory minimums lead to nothing less than bizarre results where less less harmful drugs, for example, Sudafed, which you can be prosecuted for if you possess with an intention to make methamphetamine, it's punished more harmful than something like heroin. Heroin, by far the most harmful drug by most public health measures. As you can see here, smaller numbers of doses of things like crack or meth or MDMA ecstasy receive five-year sentences and 3,333 doses of heroin. The sentences imposed don't re reflect the harmfulness of the drugs, and it doesn't reflect the social cost of different drug crimes. I've got a fact sheet that used some data developed by uh, the Department of Justice on the cost of different kinds of crimes, and from it, you can learn that powder cocaine trafficking offenses with social costs of between one hundred and twenty and four seventy five thousand dollars, 
receive a five-year sentence, the same as an economic crime with social costs of seven to 11 or eight, 12 million dollars. So it's not that drug crimes are being sentenced too harshly. It's that they're sentenced far, I mean, it's, drug crimes are being sentenced far more harshly than other types of crimes, given the social cost involved uh, in them all. Uh, I'm out of time. I've got some more things that I could say about uh, sentencing uh, disparity. That's certainly the topic that's received the most attention from uh, research scholars. I would argue that we don't really need a lot more multiple regression studies of discrimination on the part of judges because what we're asking is, is in the rules themselves. Local cultures are important, absolutely, but the actual policies represented by the guidelines and laws have driven this huge gap between white and black defendants that has come down in recent years, largely because of the revision to the crack guideline, and we need more work demonstrating other places where laws with extreme adverse impacts, but little effectiveness, are, are driving this form of, of racial disparity. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Dr. Hope. That gets us a lot to think about. One thing, um, while I've got you right here, um, I want to ask you about um, you uh, repeatedly uh, called out to the public to conduct additional analyses using sentencing guidelines data um, so that there are other sources of uh, analyses rather than just the sentencing guidelines uh, commission itself. What uh, are you familiar with any uh, training uh, resources for new researchers in this area? I um, have been told that the data sets can be um, somewhat complex, and um, in the absence of uh, someone attending a university where they have a mentor who can uh, help them, what's the best way that you would suggest for a new researcher to acclimatize themselves to the data sets and learn how to manipulate the data for accurate research? Well, it's certainly true. If, uh... A researcher starts by going to the commission's website and downloading, downloading the annual individual data files that are made available there. They could easily get around because those data files are in incredibly lengthy, complicated, and unnecessarily so, frankly. I mean, in a recent year, one of the data files had over 14,000 variables. Most of these variables are of absolutely no interest to researchers. They occasionally are needed by the commission in order to recreate exactly how the guidelines were applied to a particular case. But I have, and the federal public defenders, boiled down those data sets to a few hundred variables that are really important. And that's really enough for most, I, I wish the commission or somebody would make available a research data set that avoided some of the uh, really more administrative types of variables that are in that flat file that you download from the uh, commission, most of whose cells are empty. Um, if it's possible, to get someone to give you a boiled down data set, preferably combining across years and a good code book uh, that explains the variables uh, clearly, that would be a tremendous start and could really potentially save somebody a month of work trying to figure out uh, what the data mean and how to make it uh, workable. The commission sponsored a workshop for researchers and has a number of publications that can help, but they aren't as clear as would be nice, and they haven't sponsored a workshop for, I think, over 10 years. Uh, the NIJ sponsored a, a workshop a few years ago, and I think that would be very helpful uh, to give someone an orientation, someone who has some experience. If you can get a mentor or find someone to work with who can help you avoid some of the pitfalls, that would be 
a, a good idea. I'm retired now. I mean, you can drop me an email if you say if you really have some questions. I might be able to help because I have been working with the data set uh, for quite a while. One thing I would say is it's really important to get familiar with how the law of sensing works and how the guidelines work. You can't just look at the variables. You've got to understand the guideline system. There have been some excellent researchers who've made some tragic mistakes. Working with the data great, not understanding sentencing. Uh, there was an economist a few years ago who joined in the racial disparity debate and, and refined the control variables that were used to control for legally relevant differences among defendants. Um, and he started using the cell of the sentencing table as the control. But he didn't realize that sometimes a mandatory minimum comes in and trumps that cell. And so he didn't account for that. So he was controlling, he was expecting, his model expected defendants to be sentenced at the bottom of the cell. That was the, the predicted regression equation predicted to be sentenced at the bottom of the cell. When a lot of defendants, and they are disproportionately African-American, have a Trump that comes in and the judge hasn't any choice to sentence even within the cell in some cases, has to impose uh, the mandatory uh, minimum. If you don't properly control for that, you get a race effect that jumps out that's actually a mandatory minimum effect and you blame judges for a disparity that's actually created by Congress and the mandatory minimums. So you've really got to understand uh, how uh, the system uh, works. And one last thing I would say is that some of the most important research that, can, that needs to be done, um, we need data that the commission is not making available. They have a data set that shows the recidivism of uh, defendants. There's nothing more valuable to evaluating the effectiveness of the different sentencing policies than to have that recidivism data set. The commission argues they can't make it publicly available. I don't see why they can't somehow mask the identity of the defendants. Um, we've tried to get them to release it. So far, they've uh, refused. Uh, I'd like to see continuing pressure uh, to make additional available data available in addition to the individual data sets that are now downloadable from the commission's website. Okay, thank you. Um... It sounds like um, the best bet is to find a, uh, a learned uh, mentor in terms of working with the data. Um, uh, so for the, for the current, um, uh, thank you for that. Um, let me, um, we've been talking mainly about the federal guidelines here, um, but let me jump over to Dr. Ulmer for a second and ask, um, Dr. Arnold, you talked about your federal research, um, but I know you've done a lot of state-level sentencing guidelines and reform research. Could you talk to us a little bit about why it's important to look at both um, sentencing and federal sentencing structures, state and um, federal sentencing structures, rather than just one or the other, what, um, what the different findings are, would show us? Yes. Um, well, the federal and state uh, systems, institutions, are, are both very impactful and um, important, in, but in different ways. The federal system is, um, first of all, highly institutionally important and symbolically important. Um, it, it's what the federal justice and the federal government does. It's, it's what the Department of Justice, um, it's what their U.S. attorneys are, you know, acting on. It covers the entire country. Um, and secondly, federal, you know, federal punishments are very severe um, and deeply impactful to defendants um, who get, you know, very long imprisonment sentences. Um, so the impact on individuals lives is, is very large um and third it it's it's uh, sociologically interesting because you have this one system one legal set of policies and laws that um tries to fit over top of 50 states and 94 
federal district courts in all their variation and distinctiveness throughout the country. Um, you know, every every place from Vermont to Guam. Um, and on the state side, state courts are very important. Number one, because that's where most defendants are. Um, the large majority of of criminal defendants are um, sanctioned in state courts. Um, and so it's impactful in terms of the sheer numbers and size. And, and state courts have handle everything from, you know, minor minor misdemeanors to first degree murders. Um, and sociolog and, and states do a variety of things. Some states have guidelines, some do not. Um, some have traditional sentencing systems where there's virtually no um, structure to sentencing. Others have. Um, you know, flat and set, flat sentencing or, uh, you know, statutory minimums and maximums. And then, too, states um, and state courts and county level, you know, or municipal level courts have an enormous amount of less visible juris, uh, discretion, less visible discretion um, over, you know, the everyday lives of millions and millions of people. Um, so that's in that way, the, the state court systems are are very important to study. Thank you. Um, that that really um, shows the difference why we need to look at both of them, even though um, we've been focusing on federal sentencing. Um, Dr. Lynch, I wanted to ask you, um, the research that you've uh, discussed today and a lot of your research, um, shows that you use a lot of qualitative analysis along with your quantitative analysis, um, using uh, key stakeholder interviews, observation, et cetera. Why do you think it's important to use the qualitative as well as the quantitative, and what kind of additional insights does that give you? Thanks for that question. That's a great question. It kind of goes to um, one of the points that, that Paul just made about people not knowing what they're looking at when they're using quantitative data. Um, I know a fair amount about how courts work and about things like plea bargaining and so on. I've worked in the system. I, my husband's a criminal defense attorney. All, so I knew enough to understand sort of how the mechanics work behind, but I still found myself after doing the um, that first book or study, when I went into the field, I got a grant after that to go into the field and do the observations and interviews. I felt like, wow, I wish I had known more um, and had some of the knowledge that I had um, after doing that when I did the quantitative study. And it really actually triggered me thinking about using the data in completely different ways. So I've done subsequent studies that really think about those data um, away from just, you know, the standard multi, multiple regression, thinking about, you know, place is an important, how do, how do we kind of reconsider place? How do we reconsider um, getting at the processes, which is really the tricky part is really, you know, you can, you can well measure outcomes and you can find, you know, you can kind of specify some things that look like processes, but how can we do that better? So that's the first reason to do it is because it actually gives you that um, nuanced understanding of what you're doing with the with the data sets. And I went through the training. Um, I went to the NIJ Sentencing Commission training at um, ISPCR. So I wasn't completely naive going into it. Um, but more than that, it's really, um, it really gets it to the, how do we measure um, social and social psychological processes? And I've, um, I think Jeff will, Jeff knows, I've been frustrated with some of the assumptions made um, using quantitative analyses about what's underlying that, what are the psychological and sociological processes happening? How, what are judges thinking? What are prosecutors thinking? And so on. Um, that you just can't get to with the with the um, administrative data, and while interviews are have their own limitations, using multiple data sources and multiple approaches really triangulates around the problem, right? So you bring in you 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 add to your understanding with different forms of data, 
and with the um, observations, those are very good to see to be able to play off of what you're hearing in interviews or what people are telling you. What's it at, what's it actually look like in these different settings? What does it look like when a defense attorney is talking to a prosecutor about resolving a case? What's it look like when they're in front of the judge in the in that kind of formal setting? Um, and what are they telling you about their strategy there? Those things can really give you a clear sense about how law actually works in action. Thank you. Uh, that's very that's very helpful. I think that really gives us a better understanding of how it fits together. Um, I, I do, uh, we've got um, about 12 more minutes. Um, so let me turn to some of the audience questions. The first one, um, I think, um, pertains to any of the panelists. Um, and the question is, in your experiences, is there much inter-judge variation in response to legal changes within jurisdictions relative to between jurisdictions? Have any of you I had a chance to really look at that. Jeff, you can jump in. I um, can talk about it qualitative, qualitatively. Please a little do. Bit. Please do. Okay, You've so, looked at interjudge more than I have. Yeah, and there there are some good studies that have looked at this that have been able to get. Um, so the the data from the commission doesn't code for. I mean, they do. They have secret data, as Paul's referred to, um, that have actor level data. So you could get to the judges, but we're not. Most people are not privy to that. Some researchers have been able to get that and really look at that. And then there have been some open data sources, Massachusetts District of Massachusetts in particular, where people have looked at sort of the inner judge um, disparity. So there is some quantitative work on that. But qualitatively, um, the, I think that two things operate together within a given jurisdiction, even within a division. There's real there's differences in norms. There's sort of a range of, of ways that judges think about cases. But overlaying that is sort of, uh, you know, sort of what is imaginable as a, you know, incredibly harsh outcome versus an incredibly good outcome. And those things differ by by place. So, you know, what's a good outcome? And I was struck by this. I went from a very my northeastern district to a southern district where the norms were completely different. And I was shocked to hear what was a good deal. <laughs> yeah. What was a good judge outcome? even with the variation in judges that just the ranges are constrained by that kind of local context um so so it's really a matter of like within district variation as constrained by you know the district co context okay um great and do any of the rest of you have comment on that or should i move on Okay, I'll move on. Oh, go ahead. Dr. Hofer, were you going to say something? Uh, I would say that there is some quantitative research on inter-judge disparity. There happens to be kind of a neat methodology since cases are assigned to judges randomly in many courthouses. We have the opportunity to look at whether the differences among judges in the same random assignment pool change in response to policy changes. And uh, I did such a study for the 15 year review and it found that the guidelines did modestly reduce some of these differences among judges, even within the same uh, courthouse. And there's been some work that since Booker, unsurprisingly, some of those differences have come back with the additional, some judges are more willing to use uh, their departure power or to even challenge, uh, you know, uh, whether a guideline is good in a routine case. Uh, I still think that that kind of disparity is far less problematic than the one the racial disparity, for example, that's built in by grossly adverse, impactful and ineffective and unfair rules. Okay. Because well, local culture is important. The actual rules also do make a big difference. I mean, if we could get them amended, it would really help. <laughs> I understand. And you're pointing out something that's very important that um, to study these uh, reforms well and really understand them, you have to both look at the local context and the rules and how they work together. I mean, I think that's very important um, in this realm of research. Another question we have has to do with disparity in different types of cases, particularly this person is interested in are there difference in adherence to the guidelines or the reform 
in terms of victim versus non-victim crimes? And then within the subset of victim crimes, is there a disparity across those crimes? And whether any of you have looked at that or are familiar with the research in that area? I, I can say that the- I can't think of anything that's looked at that breakdown. Yeah, and, and I would say that the federal system data is not the best place to look at that because the, the particularly the violent crimes are a very odd subset of, oh. um, it, it's just not, they're not, your kind of regular street victim crimes are not likely to come to federal court, except you've got the Indian, um, you know, the Indian country cases where you do have it. So you have these regional differences, you have these population differences um, and jurisdictional differences that really matter. And I just want to say to Paul's early point, I totally agree on the on the rules. The rules to me are the framework for, for all of that, that shape all of that and against which people sort of operate. So the rules really do constrain direct um, what the realm of possibility is. So I'm always talking within those rules. Right, yeah. And I, I, the next question I think speaks to that and also some of what you were um, talking about earlier, Dr. Lynch. The question I, is, is kind of difficult to um, respond to, um, give a pat answer to, but the, um, the questioner wants to know what how you would recommend learning about sentencing structures, given the complexity and the differences across structures and the need to really understand them before you jump into the research, what's the best way to familiarize yourself with, um, with those structures? Jeff should start with that one because he's trained so many students and has <laughs> has been so on the ground doing this stuff on qualitatively well, and quantitatively. Well, thank you, um, but uh, you you've done as much and more. Um, it's hard to it's hard to point to one source, you know, one thing you should look at, but I suppose you you should start with kind of review articles, um, articles that um, talk about, you know, articles written written by independent scholars, like Paul has talked about, that um, such as Richard Fraz, um, Michael Tonry, um, Kevin Wright, and others, um, and uh, that talk about first the, the development and, oh, um, Kim Steeth, um, the legal scholar Kim Steeth, Steeth and uh, Jose Cabranes, um, their work. Um, but uh, the, evol the evolution and structure of you know how the guidelines came to be, um, be what they were. Then review articles like in the the 20 2019 uh, Crime and Justice volume that Paul talked about. That Paul has a piece in, and I have a piece in. And there are reviews of disparity research um, in in that volume. Um, and then third, I, I it would you know just read the key studies, um, read read the Booker, you know the Booker research studies back that uh, debated back and forth the impact of Booker. Um, you know read read uh, you know read the 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 uh, reports, the U.S. Sentencing Commission reports, and compare and contrast those with, with, um, you know, with, with other research people did. Finally, I would say, like Mona said, and, um, you know, there's just a ton of, you know, the federal sentencing world um, and the guidelines and, and how, how attorneys plea bargain with the guidelines and, and you know the role of probation, and it's just so incredibly complicated. You know, one of the best things you might do is talk to, you know, a federal defender or two. Um, you know, I, I'm convinced that that people like federal defenders and assistant U.S. attorneys and judges and and uh, tribal um, tribal court liaisons. I, I'm convinced that these are the pe only people that truly understand how this all works. <laughs> So federal probation um, people too. So so 
um, I would say, you know, talk to people that actually do it. I would echo that as a starting point. I they, there, you, there are times that one can read articles and you can know that the person actually never even sat and watched what goes on in federal court. Um, you learn a lot through observation and talking to people. Um, and it's really important to understand the kind of basic ground rules for how law gets put into action um, that you can't just get from articles because articles aren't you know, written for that purpose. And so um, really getting to know your subject um, is important. Thank you. I would agree with all of that. Did you have anything you want to add to that, um, Dr. Hofer? No, I think that covers it. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. Um, I think that's great advice. Um, we are at just about at the end of our uh, session. So I want to thank you all, the presenters. You've been great. And Raven, thank you so much. Um, you've made my job easier um, working in the background. Um, thank you all very much, and I want to remind the audience that this um, uh, webinar will it has been recorded and will be posted uh, on the NRJ website, and uh, so you're welcome to come and take a look at that. Also, while you're there, um, please take a look at the funding opportunities we have, the training opportunities, uh, the research that's been completed um, that we're sharing with the public. Um, that's what we're there for. So I hope you do um, uh, join the join us in future webinars, and also um, uh, check out our website frequently and um, repeatedly. Thank you all so very much. I think this has been really helpful. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.